National Catholic Broadcasting Council presents Reflections on the Mass. Your host, Bishop Paul Andre de Rushe. Today is Holy Thursday, the first of the three great holy days, which we call the Triduum in Latin. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday leading into the Vigil of Easter. On this evening, in all the churches throughout the world, communities will gather to celebrate the Eucharist in, commemor in commemoration of the, the first Eucharist, the first time that Jesus broke the bread, shared the wine, saying to his disciples, this is my body, this is my blood. So I thought it would be good for us to reflect on the Eucharist in our lives, on the meaning of Mass, Speaking with people, I often hear them tell me that they find Mass boring, to be quite honest. It's always the same thing. It's always the same ritual. It's like sitting down every day to, to eat the same meal. And uh, some people argue, well, you have to eat because it keeps you alive. But I want to suggest to you that the Mass, when we understand it correctly, the Eucharist, is much more than just about being kept alive spiritually. It's much more than a static celebration of our faith. It's actually a dynamic means of transformation. Our Pope, Benedict XVI, when he was still Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, gave a talk on the Eucharist a few years back in which he spoke about the Eucharist as a sacrament of transformation. Basing my thought on his words and on his writings, I'd like to suggest to you six transformations that are involved in the sacrament of the Eucharist that make it such a dynamic sacrament. In the first talk that I'm giving right now, we'll look at the first three of those transformations that actually have to do with the Triduum itself. What happened? on Easter Sunday, what happened on Good Friday, and what happened on Holy Thursday. On Easter Sunday morning, we know that Jesus rose from the dead, but we can't truly really know what that means. It is such a unique experience. Nobody has ever experienced this before in the history of humanity, nor since. We cannot imagine what this meant for Jesus, nor can we imagine what the disciples saw or experienced. The stories of the resurrection themselves seem to be full of contradictions. Jesus is not there, and all of a sudden he appears. Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, don't touch me, but to Thomas he says, touch me. Jesus seems to be a ghost, and yet he eats. Jesus walks with uh, disciples who do not recognize him, and suddenly they recognize him. All these seeming contradictions indicate that the experience of the resurrection is beyond our ability to describe or to understand. But what we can understand is how the disciples were transformed. When the apostles met Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, they were changed. They had been full of fear. Now they were full of courage. They had been dispersed. Now they were gathered in community. They felt they had lost all purpose to their lives. Now they had a mission. What happened? In the experience of the resurrection, they encountered God's graciousness. God did something that was unexpected, that was beyond all imagining. God's great gift of life bursting forth in Jesus. And they experienced God's forgiveness, because in the resurrection, Jesus did not condemn them for having run away on Good Friday. He welcomed them. He received them. They experienced the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to them, receive the gift of the Spirit, a new power within them. And they experienced being entrusted with the mission. The disciples were transformed. The transformation of the apostles is rooted in what happened on Good Friday. On Good Friday, 
Jesus transformed an act of violence into a saving act of love. An act which led to his death became an act which leads to our life. Before I was made a bishop about 13 years ago, I had the great opportunity to spend a year studying in Rome. I lived at the Canadian College, not too far away from the Vatican. I often went to pray the Basilica, and I loved going to the chapel. There is exposed that great called the Pieta, you know the one that Michelangelo sculpted where Mary the dead body of her son Jesus. I also marveled at the way Michelangelo was able to transform a piece of rock, of dead marble, into the most wonderful expression of love and of tenderness and of mercy. He did this with a hammer and a chisel. I tell myself that something similar happened on the cross. Jesus transformed an awful act of violence, of brute violence, a, a murder, a judicial murder. He transformed this into an act of saving love. And how did he do this? Not with a hammer and chisel, but with the power of the Spirit. At least the letter to the Hebrews tells us this, that it is in the power of the eternal spirit that Jesus made of his death a sacrifice of love to God his Father and for us. When we look at the cross, what we should be seeing, what we should be focusing on is not the suffering of Jesus. That would be like looking at the Pieta and, and trying to study the rock or the marble. What we want to look at is the tenderness the compassion, the mercy that God is showing us in his death. This is the great transformation that Christ effected in his death. He spoke the most ultimate, most powerful word of God's love for us to the point that I think we should be able to say that it is not so much Jesus' suffering that saves us as his love for us. And experiencing that love will be the call for us to be transformed. But Jesus did something else. He foreshadowed his death. He gave the meaning to his death on Holy Thursday. On Holy Thursday, Jesus gathered with his apostles to celebrate the Paschal meal, the Passover meal. The Jewish people still celebrate this great Passover meal. They've been doing it for 3,000 years, commemorating how Moses led the people out of slavery in Egypt towards the Promised Land, God's great work of liberation for his people. Jesus celebrated that meal with his apostles the night before he died. But what was surprising was that at the moment when he took the bread, which is part of the Passover meal, and said a blessing, which is also part of the meal, he then broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And when he took the cup of wine, which is part of the Passover meal, and gave the blessing, which is also part of the Passover meal, he added these extraordinary words, this is my blood that is shed for you, the blood of a new covenant. Jesus was transforming the Passover meal. It was no longer simply a commemoration of what God had done before through Moses, but what God was now doing through Jesus. He was renewing the covenant, establishing it in the gift that Jesus would make of his life for us. What Jesus was doing on Holy Thursday evening with his apostles was giving us a prophetic gesture explaining the meaning of his death on the cross, revealing the meaning of what he would do the next day. But not only that, after having shared the bread and the wine with his disciples, he said, do this in memory of me. It was no longer to be celebrated in memory of Moses, but in memory of Jesus. This meal now became the great gathering gesture, the great symbolic act by which the people, the disciples, 
that would follow Jesus would recognize themselves in him, would recognize in this celebration the source and the summit of their lives, would find in this ritual meal that Jesus had just shared with his apostles the great understanding of their own identity as disciples of Christ. The transformation of the apostles on Easter Sunday morning, the transformation of the death of Jesus into a saving act of love, the transformation of the Passover meal into the Eucharist, three of the great transformations that are part of the Holy Days. Jesus transform the Passover meal into the prophetic gesture explaining his death on the cross? Why did he transform his death on the cross into a saving act of love for us? It was in order that his apostles would be transformed on Easter Sunday morning in the power of his resurrection so that they would be changed. 
the celebration of the Eucharist aims to do the same thing in us, to change us, to transform us, so that, like the apostles, we might experience the gracefulness of our God, the mercy of our God, the power of our God, the purpose of our God. I want to look at this a bit with you. Three transformations, the transformation of the bread and the wine, the transformation of the people of God and the transformation of the world. Let's start with the bread and wine at the Eucharist. We all know, we all believe that the bread and wine are transformed. They become the body and blood of Christ. But what does that mean? When we use the expression body and blood in our 20th century Western mentality, we tend to think of body and blood in terms of anatomy, physiology, physics. We think of body in terms of flesh and bones and organs. We think of blood in terms of serum and plasma and type A and type O. The Jews didn't t think this way in the time of Jesus. Jesus, when he spoke of his body, was speaking of himself as being present in this world. The body is the way you enter into a relationship with others. Through your body you speak, you listen, you see, you can hug or you can hit. This is your body. This is you active in the world. When Jesus says, this is my body, that's what he's saying. This is me, present and active in the world. And blood. What is blood for the Jews? The Jews didn't even know that blood circulated in the body. They knew nothing of how blood worked. The only thing they knew is if you cut yourself and the bleeding didn't stop, you would die. So blood is the liquid of life. It's life itself. So when Jesus says, this is my blood, he's saying, this is my life poured out for you, my life given for you. When we say the bread and the wine, are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. We are not talking of a physical transformation. Any physicist who studied the bread or the wine after the consecration would determine that it's the same thing. The transformation is at a deeper level than the level of physics. The transformation is at the level of what is true, what is real, something that cannot be touched, something that cannot be seen but something that is so deep that it is the realest thing possible. And so we speak of the real presence of Christ. It really is Jesus, his body, his presence active among us. It really is his blood, his life poured out for us. This is the transformation that occurs within the context of the Eucharist. And it only occurs because the priest calls down the Holy Spirit. He puts his hand over the gifts and says, send down your spirit, Father, to change, to transform this bread and this wine into the living, active presence of Christ among us, into his life for us. This is the first great transformation in the Eucharist. Some people stop there. They think that that's it. St. Thomas Aquinas would not agree with him. The great theologian of the Middle Ages said that's only half of the transformation. He says the true point of the transformation is to transform us. And that indeed is the second great transformation in the Eucharist. After the priest has consecrated the bread and wine, after he's called the Spirit down to make of this bread and wine the body and blood of Christ, he calls on the Spirit again. And he calls on the Spirit to come down upon the whole community, the whole assembly, the people of God gathered, to transform them, to transform us into one body, one Spirit in Christ, to make us one. When we receive the body and blood of Christ, we all share the same bread, the same cup. We are sharing the same Christ. And so we are united in Christ. This is why before sharing the bread and the wine, we often are invited to share with one another a sign of peace. How can we love God if we do not love our brother and sister who is standing next to us? How can we be in communion with God if we are not in communion with our brothers and sisters? 
I sometimes joke, I say, it's remarkable how at Mass we can say, yes, we are one, but as soon as we get into the parking lot, the unity disintegrates as people honk horns at each other and tell them to move and get out of the way. We revert so quickly to our traditional patterns of self-concern and self-centeredness. The Eucharist wants to transform us, bring us out of ourselves. The Eucharist wants to make us one body, one spirit, caring for each other more than we care for ourselves. This is the great transformation which the Eucharist should be affecting in our lives. The more we celebrate the Eucharist, the more we should be growing in our love for each other as we are united with the Christ who died out of love for each one of us, for each and every one of us. If I'm not growing in that love, if I find myself hard-hearted towards my brother or my sister, or indifferent. It's a sign that perhaps I have not truly opened myself to what the Eucharist is all about, that I've not truly made myself vulnerable to the power of the Spirit that God wants to send to me to transform me as the bread and wine have been transformed. And yet, it does not end there. There is another transformation to be effected. That is the transformation of the world. Jesus came so that his kingdom, the kingdom of his Father, the kingdom of justice, peace, and joy should arise in the whole world. And we are sent as messengers of that good news, and we are sent as workers at the Lord's vineyard. The transformation of the world is the ultimate transformation. This whole self-gift of Jesus on the cross, prefigured in the Holy Thursday Supper, the transformation of the apostles, the first of this new people of God to be sent, the transformation of the bread and wine at Mass, the transformation of We as individuals into one body and one spirit, all of this is meant to go and change the world. When at the end of the Mass, the priest says, go, he's not simply dismissing us. In old movies, there was always the words, the end, that would flash up on the screen, as if the producer was scared that people wouldn't realize that it was over. It was time to leave now. Go, go. That's not the meaning of the priest sending us at the end of Mass. It's more as if the priest was like a a starter in a race with his pistol calling on the racers, on your mark, get set, go. And that's what the priest is telling us, or the deacon when there's a deacon who's present, on your mark. Get said, now go in the peace of Christ. Go transform the world. Go change the world. The Eucharist is not a restaurant where we come to be fed and go back replete and comfortable. The Eucharist is more like a meals on wheels where we come to receive food, not just for ourselves, but to bring it to those who are not there. There are people out in the world who hunger and thirst for love, for friendship, for a bit of joy, for some meaning in their lives. Who will bring them? Who will bring them the presence of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, if not us? We who have been touched and transformed, we who have been nourished by the body and blood of Christ, we who have been united in one people, we now have one mission. We are sent to transform the world in the same power of the Spirit to bring the justice, the peace, the joy of God's kingdom to people who do not know justice, nor peace, nor joy. The transformation of the world is what the Mass is all about.
and it's through us that the Mass will achieve its purpose. So the Mass is not a boring, static, repetitive ritual, but it is a powerful means by which God is changing the world. It is a dynamic, powerful tool and counter medium through which God is touching our hearts so that we might touch the hearts of people around us. Let us always thank God for this great gift and let us celebrate the Eucharist in the fullness of its meaning. Our thanks to Bishop Paul Andre de Rocher for the gift of his insights and his time.